So on the last Monday of the month, moving forward, I'll tell you what will provide context to the comments and questions y'all left on episodes from earlier in the month. This gives me a chance to give you a little bit more information on some of the areas that you were thinking about, but also an opportunity to answer any frequently asked questions also. And y'all, we really need to do that because y'all, y'all had everything to say about the episodes from this month. Between the stories of Marvin Gaye to last week about Pam Greer, there was so much to talk about. So yes, in a second, we're going to dive deep. But before we get into that, Hey, if you're new in the pews, this is I'll Tell You What. I'll Tell You What is a podcast that shares the weddings, marriages, and romances of Black figures throughout time. We bask on these relationships not to be messy, but to remind you of the passion in our past and to humanize the people we put on pedestals. Basically, it's all love. Black history. And I'm Ashley, your favorite rock and tooth that tells you these stories every single Monday. So are you ready? Let's get into it. If you remember just last week, we talked about the love stories of the one and only Miss Pam Greer. Now, as you know, though she got close several times, Pam Greer, the legend, the actress herself, never got married. And Pam Adams wants to know, why do we even talk about her then? You know what? That is actually a very, very good question. The answer for that was actually explained here during the week, but you might have missed it and that's okay. So let me explain again. So yes, the Isle in I'll tell you what, is because for the most part, we reflect on the moments that led these figures to the aisle and what happened after they said I do. But not everyone marries and there are many valid reasons for that as well. It's why the I'll tell you what spiel was changed to sharing the weddings, marriages, and romances of black figures throughout time. The majority of those love stories will include weddings and marriages, but occasionally that doesn't happen. For instance, the story about Diane Carroll and Sidney Poitier or the women that Barry Gordy and Stevie Wonder love, or even the relationship between Deborah Lee and Bob Johnson. So as I mentioned in the episode, we need to honor the women, men, and people that choose their happiness and contentment as well as those that marry, especially when that choice was deliberate. Now Pam Greer was engaged or close to getting married a few times and I felt like though she didn't make it down the aisle, her stories were still worth sharing, especially when a lot of y'all saw yourselves in her stories as well. So again, I'll tell you what didn't change our focus, but we are more inclusive to make sure that we can share these stories when it is appropriate. Does that make sense? Let me know what you think. So when I mentioned that Kareem Abdul-Jabbar gave Pam Greer the convert to Islam and marry me or else we're done ultimatum on her birthday, a lot of y'all felt a lot of ways. Let me be very, very clear about that particular situation. The versions of this story that were shared by both Pam Greer and Kareem Abdul-Jabbar are likely forgetting a piece, right? There's one side, the other side, and the truth. Uh huh. But you gotta remember, this was a 20-something year old Pam and a 20-something year old Kareem. He was new in his faith and he was learning a lot about Islam, not only through reading, but through a spiritual mentor named Hamas. Now, if you believe in a certain religion, do you remember a time when you like first got into it and you wanted to be so so perfect in your faith. I think that's essentially what Kareem was doing back then. I mean, he was still very young. He didn't know a lot, but he knew he wanted to do right by Allah. And that meant marrying a Muslim woman. So because this took place during his relationship to Pam, he wanted her to join him in this journey as well. But Pam was her mother's child and needed to feel as if her autonomy wouldn't be limited if she were to convert and become his wife. But you know what? In 2015, Kareem wrote this in response to criticism around their relationship quote, I am still a Muslim. I have never regretted that decision. However, my views on what a Muslim is and how he should or she should behave have gone through changes. He also said, quote, also to set the record straight, I don't agree with a lot of things that the 20s Kareem believe. And for those of you that are no longer in your 20s, did you do things that you cringe at when you think back to that time? Because I know I did. So yeah, girl, essentially they broke up on her birthday, but honestly, that relationship was probably on its last leg anyway. 
Honestly, the episodes around the relationship between Pam Greer and basketball phenomenon in the making, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, made a lot of y'all talk about a lot of different things, more specifically about what it means to actually be a Muslim woman. So thank you to everybody that kindly tried to explain what is what. So I kind of want to clear this up a little bit. Pam Greer wrote that she struggled with the possible conversion because of what she read in her research. Because Kareem had recently converted to Islam, she wanted to see if she could too. When they realized that this was actually becoming an actual relationship and not just a fling, he said, quote, I'd like us to get married, but he could only, quote, marry a woman of the same religion. Now she studied the Quran and based on her interpretation, she felt like it was, quote, oppressive to women. Now he tried saying that the new Islam, quote, embraces everybody and loves everybody. She even told her mom about it and her mom was like, mm, I'm not sure based off what she had read in National Geographic magazines. Pam said she read about how women would have to leave their homes and stay somewhere else when their cycles were on because they were unclean and how there were different rules around when and if you could drive and if you had to cover your hair. And then in some areas that were very strict, breaking these rules would be punishable by death. So not just that, but she wondered what would happen if he wanted to have other wives or if he wanted to get a divorce. Would she be fine would she be taken care of and though he said he wouldn't do a lot of these things she was concerned about she wasn't sure if he would change his mind down the line and what that would potentially mean for her and her relationship now you have to remember this was before the internet her resources were mostly this book he let her read green spiritual mentor and a few others that he knew that had converted she was so afraid of like the worst case scenario ultimately that's what helped her make her decision now many of you said that there are more conservative Muslims and there are some that actually are more progressive but that's like with every religion right so all that to say Pam's concerns were extremely valid but honestly she really only knew what she read and what she was being told now luckily for us we have access to more information so if we were to make a decision as big as that we would be able to fully see all the sides way faster than Pam was able to so Tell me, what do you think? All right, so now let's move on to the episode on Dr. J or Julius Irving. Now, if y'all didn't notice, there were a lot of people that were very, very upset that these stories popped up on their feed. One, I had nothing to do with that piece. But two, I really want to unpack this because most people that disapproved were either people with like no picture and usernames with a whole bunch of numbers or mostly men. Now, I believe that these are people that likely have no idea what I'll tell you what is about. And so when this video just popped up on their feed, they felt all sorts of ways. The general sentiments for that this is nobody's business or that it is gossip. Okay, well, let's unpack that. If these details were nobody's business, then why did Dr. J write an autobiography? And for those that don't know, an autobiography is when the biography is actually written by the person themselves. About 90% of the information from that episode came directly from his book. Maybe another 5% came from articles he was directly quoted in. Now again, here at I'll Tell You What, we don't reflect on these stories to be messy, but we do want to humanize the people we place on pedestals. Now to say this is gossip is also not true because the definition of gossip is, quote, casual or unconstrained conversation or reports about other people tip involving details that are not confirmed as being true. So at I'll Tell You What, I purposely use historical and biographical information so that we do not wallow in the salaciousness of these stories. Now, that's not to say that they still don't pop up, but I can't control that. There are definitely other platforms that intentionally do deep dives into scandals and dramas for that purpose solely, but that is really not what we do here. This is why I also share the books and the resources I use while doing the research on these stories so you can read it for yourselves and learn about these people more so you can build more context and make your own decisions. All that to say, some of these great celebrity figures were amazing professionally and not so great personally. And that's not to say that's okay, but I mean, realistically, that's life. Or maybe they did a lot of foolish stuff when they were young, but they're older and more mature now and they've apologized 
All we can hope for is that folks take accountability of the sins of yesterday. That's all. Does that make sense? Now, when I shared that a reporter discovered that former tennis star and current tennis media professional Alexandra Stevenson was Dr. J's daughter, a lot of y'all felt like that was not their business to discover that. So now we must discuss essentially what is journalism at its core. So sadly, yes, one of the side effects of being in the public eye is having your information being open for speculation, discussion, all of the things. And because Julius Irving was a very known basketball player, and here's this upcoming tennis star that is noticeably mixed, someone was bound to ask and investigate who her father was, especially when it was known that her mother was a known sports writer based in Philly. So the reporter was doing essentially what journalists are supposed to do, which is research. This is what you're taught to do when you go to school for media or journalism. You have to find legitimate sources to make your news legitimate, which means real. A lot of us see this from a personal perspective and not a professional stance. I'm pretty sure he wasn't unearthed this information just to cause drama in their lives. He's doing the job he was paid to do. And you know what? Honestly, when he uncovered this information, he sat on it, I think for almost a year, because at that time, Alexandra wasn't relevant enough in the tennis world for it to become a story, despite Julius being Dr. J. But around the time she headed to Wimbledon about a year later, she actually was newsworthy enough for this to be a story. Honestly, sometimes journalists will give the people in the story a heads up just in case they want to say something or clarify detail or even if they want to have some control over the narrative. But again, that guy was just doing his job. We don't have to like it, but that's the truth. All right, so let's wrap this up with the episode that went viral, viral, the love stories of Marvin Gaye. Now I had a feeling that this episode would probably be a little interesting, especially when I started doing the research, but baby, I had no idea and I don't think any of y'all did as well. So about Marvin Gaye fathering a child with his at the time teenage niece Denise Gordy and even the ones about his relationship with his second wife who was a teenager when they met. Several of y'all left comments very similar to this one that said quote interesting how you handled the sexual abuse with the niece consensual yeah okay right. Like, I shared a very disturbing detail about Marvin Gaye. Hell, his entire story was hauntingly layered. The language I use was the language that was written about that moment. So let's be precise. What exactly was written in that Michael Eric Dyson biography of Marvin Gaye about the child he created with his niece? Quote, Marvin had made love to a minor, apparently with the consent of all involved. Still, Denise was under the age of legal consent for sexual relations and Marvin might have gone to jail for statutory rape. Now the biography also went on to allude that Anna and Marvin made a conscious decision to let Denise have the child since Anna couldn't conceive on her own allegedly. Now that plus the quote and the details that I already shared in that episode imply the obvious and I don't personally feel as if I have to spell it out every time something egregious takes place. There are Obvious dynamics at play that don't make this consensual, especially by today's definition of the word. But all I do here is share what I read and allow you to process that information how you see fit. There are a lot of societal changes and feelings that have evolved over the years. And a lot of people used to do a lot of stuff that definitely would not fly today. Does that excuse any of the behavior of this or anything else I've shared? Absolutely not. And for the most part, especially on that episode, I try to keep my thoughts to myself when I'm telling y'all these stories because there is a lot of things that I personally don't agree with, but I don't want my opinions to influence how you interpret the facts and the details that I share. So to tie all this up, I said consensual, but you and I both know what the definition of consensual really means. And I will leave it at that.
So during the explanation of the beginning of the love story between Marvin Gaye and his second wife, Jan Hunter Gaye, a few of you thought that the song Let's Get It On is about a teenager. So I get why you would think that Marvin Gaye was introduced to Jan when she was 17 years old. And my apologies, I did say 16. So he was working in the studio on the song Let's Get It On when they met. She came to the studio with her mom because her mom's husband's friend was working on the song with Marvin. Marvin was supposed to come to her 17th birthday party and serenade her but he didn't so the invitation to the studio was his way of trying to make it up to her so technically no the song is not about Jan so some of you wanted to know more about Marvin Gaye's father and why he unalived his son. In the days leading up to Marvin Gaye's demise, he was depressed, paranoid, and suicidal of Sue. Days before he died, he tried jumping out of a moving car that was going around 60 miles per hour, I believe. And even a year or so before that, his ex-wife Jan said, quote, he did not look good. He moved back home with the one woman he could always trust, his mother and the man who hated him more than he hated himself his father. He was also very much partaking in a lot of the things, including the can of co, and got a pew to keep in the house because he was so convinced that someone wanted to unalive him, so he kept it for protection. So the day before Marvin Gaye would have turned 45, his father realized he could not find this letter in the mail about insurance. He searched the entire house for it. From downstairs, quote, he shouted to his wife as he looked for the letter. Now Marvin, the son, shouted back and was basically like, if you got something you want to say to mother, which is what he called his mom, you need to come up here and say it to her face. So he did. Marvin and his mom were in Marvin's bedroom and his father came in screaming at his mom. Marvin didn't like that, pushed him out of the room and apparently, quote, gave him some very hard licks. That was not good. Marvin's dad left the room and when he came back a few minutes later, he had Marvin's pew pew in his hand. He pointed at his son and let it rip. It hit Marvin's heart. Now, not feeling like that was enough, though his child was obviously slumped over, his father walks closer and lets another one go. Marvin's mom, on the other hand, is screaming for her life because she is afraid she's next. His dad goes downstairs, quote, took a seat on the front porch, threw the pew on the lawn, and waited for the authorities, according to the biographer David Ritz. Two months later, Marvin's mom would file for divorce after 49 years of marriage, but she would also post his $30,000 bond. And after all of that, Marvin's dad was sentenced to five years probation because he quote, pose no threat to society, was in bad health, and could possibly get worse by incarceration. He convinced the judge that he was afraid for his life, and instead of giving him six years in prison, he just had to do psychiatric counseling. Ah, <sighs> and then of course there was this question that actually I've gotten a few times as well, sometimes in DMs. Why do I say quote, right? <laughs> so, Great question. When I say quote, I want y'all to know, I'm trying to establish that I'm not saying this, I'm quoting someone else. I include quotes so that you're aware of the sentiments that were actually spoken or written that relate to whatever it is that I'm talking about. So I think this can be confusing because we do exist in the age where journalism has been so bastardized and we have bloggers touting themselves as journalists or at least news providers. I mean, have you ever seen that meme that was like black folks will believe in anything written on a white background in black text. So quotation marks historically aren't used to throw shade or to be alleged, but literally to share what somebody else said. It has been a while since somebody has asked me what has happened to my face, my eye, my cheek. But because birth date lasagna wants to know, let's get this out the way. But the mark on my face right here that you see is called lichen spinulosis. Now I've had this for a little over five years and I'm currently seeing a dermatologist for it. It is something that can take a very long time to go away. And according to Cleveland Clinic, quote, there aren't any treatments that can cure it, but it usually clears up over time. And sometimes over time can mean decades. So no, it's not a birthmark. No one put their hands on me. There's no need to worry or be concerned. It is just the skin condition. And you know what? I thought I was alone in getting these type of comments, 
I was watching Jokes on You podcast. Love it, by the way. And Mel said that folks were asking her if she had been abused too because she has eczema, I think, on her face. And I remember looking at a TikTok that Marissa from Retail Wall Black had posted and someone asked her something along the same lines too about what I believe was her birthmark. So just a little advice if you're going to ask someone about something you see in a video. One, if you're truly concerned, you'll ask discreetly. You're going to send a DM or an email. Two, don't always assume the worst because it's wild that so many of y'all will hop immediately to abuse instead of assuming literally anything else. And number three, just because you enjoy someone's content does not give you permission to know what is going on with them. So for everyone that was genuine when they did ask about it, thank you. I am okay, but please don't ever ask me again. Okay, so the final one. In the videos about Marvin Gaye and Pam Greer, I told y'all about the types of proposals I do not like, but Kamani Lauren actually wanted to know what are my favorite types of proposals, so let me tell you. I'm not sure if a lot of y'all know, but in addition to I'll Tell You What, I've been doing a wedding podcast with my best friend for four years called Hugh I Do. If you're planning your wedding, you're gonna absolutely love it. But because I've been doing this for such a long time, I've seen a lot of different types of proposals. Ones I love, ones I don't care for, and everything in between. I wanna share what my favorite types of proposals actually are. I love seeing the proposals where the one that's doing the proposing explains all the reasons why they love that person and how they come to the conclusion that they want to spend their life with that person forever. And then they ask, will you marry me? And then they wait on their partner to respond before placing the ring on the finger. And I also love the proposals that feel like another day in the life, like another date night, another weekend, another day. Not some Something you feel was completely out of the blue that would give you a sign that's like, wait, am I about to get engaged? But also that's just my personal preference because I've seen some of those types of proposals and they are so beautiful when they're executed so well. I also love it when they find a way to include the family and friends. Like either they're listening in, they're in another room, or they're waiting to celebrate with them later at another place. It also shows to me the importance of the village in their lives but also how well their closest friends and family can keep a secret. But I also love it when the proposer does what they believe that the person they're proposing to will actually love because they actually know that person. They're intentional about listening to the things that they want because you know what? Some of us have preferences on how we want to get engaged or the type of ring we want it. And just to say that like, oh, I propose to you or hey, I gave you a ring. If it's the type of ring you don't like or if it's the style of proposal that that person doesn't care for it tells me more that you don't know that person and y'all probably shouldn't get married. I got engaged July 2019 but beforehand I told my husband there were several things I did and did not want when he proposed. I didn't want him to slide the ring on my finger before he asked. I didn't want him to get down on one knee and just open a ring box like that was enough and I didn't want him to do anything that made that day feel like it was not something we would usually do but I also just didn't want like a proposal at the crib. But I also didn't want a public proposal in front of strangers or something that just felt uninspiring like a dinner proposal. No shade, but that's just what I didn't want. So what I did want was our family and friends to be there, more specifically, at least my mom. I wanted the proposal to be just us in the room by ourselves and our people to be very close by. And I wanted it to be captured because I always heard that you don't remember what is being said because of all the emotions rushing. And he did all of that. It was beautiful. So many people that meant so much to us were there and it automatically became an engagement party afterwards. So all in all, I just love the proposals that truly show the love between the two and the excitement meant to take their relationship to the next level. But y'all tell me, what are your favorite proposals? And if you have been engaged, tell me how the question was popped and all of those things. Cause I love that stuff. <laughs> And all runners, this will wrap this month's I'll Tell You Too. Don't forget to follow us everywhere, subscribe everywhere, leave a podcast review, even if you watch the episode. Also, you can head to the links in the notes below if you want to support the show by grabbing some merch or donating a coin or two. Thank you, thank you, thank you if you do. Don't forget a Patreon is coming very, very soon. You're gonna love it. Don't forget, we're diving into the love stories of our favorite football players and coaches very, very soon. See you in the pews.